Testing. Okay. We've got a couple of minutes. Some people arriving now. India's here, brilliant. <clears throat> Climbing crew. Okie dokie. If people are arrive late, but David, our wonderful, invisible, but very present and it's essential engineer, who's taking care of tonight's uh, online stuff. We'll let them in. Um, good evening and welcome to Grow at Home Artist Talks, a series where we hear from artists and authors about their work and practice. And Grow at Home, um, which is a, an online um, live stream that we've been doing all through the COVID period, was made possible, is made possible by the Arts Council England Culture Recovery Fund, which we're really grateful for. Um, just to let you know, we will be live streaming and recording tonight, and this will be archived on our website, and we also sometimes use screen grabs for publicity purposes. So please be aware that if you are not comfortable um, being recorded, you need to switch off your webcam. Um, there will be a question and answer at the, with the artist at the end of the talk, but please put any questions and comments you have in the chat, and I'll um, take care of them and field them to uh, our artist um, when we're ready, after she's finished talking. So without um, further ado, um, tonight we meet Emily Hanna, an East London-based painter and sculptor who works with light, seeing it as a, seeing as it, seeing it as a three-dimensional material that can change our perception and interaction with a space. Her most recent series of paintings is centered around the gentrification of London's warehouse and creative districts, documenting how we turn things we see as dirty or dilapidated into polished objects of desire, barely recognizable from the original. In line with this subject matter, she takes discarded materials from around her and breathes new life into them, turning trash left out to rot into objects of beauty and value. Upon first glance, these pieces have no connection to their roots, but upon further observation, their tattered paths peer through, imperfect and rough, cold and damp, and yet warm in spirit, entrenched in community and memories, given a new facade, a fresh sheen, but no fresh paint job taking away from their underground, grimy, yet beautiful beginnings. Um, good evening, Emily Hanna. Um, Thank you for taking part in Grow uh, Artist Talks. Um, we look forward to hearing what you say about your work. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I'm Emily Hanna. I am an artist currently working in Hackney Wick. I've been in the area for about, gosh, four, four and a half years now, bouncing around the different warehouses. Um, I, my practice is predominantly focused on painting, printmaking, sculpture and installation. Um, and I suppose at different times, uh, I, I have focused on each of those individually. At the moment, I'm, I'm mainly working through painting. Um, my work is generally kind of loosely centered around the idea of light as a three-dimensional or physical object or form. Um, it's, I, I look at it as an, an indicator of space uh, and how we interact with it and uh, move within it. Um, I like, I really like the idea that light can, um, light can uh, change not only our physical perception of a space, but our emotional engagement with it. Um, and like, I like to look at it, like when you have an object in front of you, you have, I suppose, two things. You've got the physical object and then its shadow counterpart. And I, I, I think that is equally as important. 
um, in our um, understanding of that object. Um, lately, I've also been looking at uh, the idea of warehouse culture and gentrification. Um, as Pete said, I, I've been looking into how we take uh, the grungy or um, unwanted and we we kind of turn it into an object of desire um, in, in the sense of gentrification and Hackney Wick specifically, I am looking at how, you know, you have uh, an area that is filled with industry um, and, and production. Um, and then, you know, the artists move in because it's the only space that they can afford. And, um, a lot of it is unused and unwanted and then they get pushed out uh, by the developers and young professionals who, you know, see the space and uh, what the artists have made it. it they brought in culture. They've, um, they've made it more habitable. <laughs> um, uh, and I suppose I'm just really interested in how, an area can change so much in such a short period of time. Um, as I said, I've only been in Hackney Wick for about four and a half years, which in the whole scheme of things isn't really all that long. Um, but I, in, in the time that I've been here, it is it has completely changed. It's completely unrecognisable from the place that I first moved into. Um, which is, I suppose, a whole part of the process. But, you know, often, like, I'll walk down the street and it, it's quite a bizarre feeling because it, it's all so new um, and I don't recognise it at all. I could literally be anywhere. And it's somewhere that I've been every day for the last four and a half years, pretty much. Um, yeah, so I, I, find it, I find it quite interesting how, you know, something that is well used and I suppose discarded and you can kind of create this completely different thing from it that, you know, you wouldn't look at it and first think that it came from those roots, uh, but inspection, and, um, you can kind of see its history, I suppose. Um, I guess a place that I wanted to start off uh, was um, when I was living in Australia and, you know, why I decided to move to become an artist. Essentially, I was working as a teacher. I studied to, to be an art teacher for a few years and um, I was working as one for about all up about five years. Um, and I suppose I went into teaching because I, I didn't think that there was any other option. I, I had been, wanted to be an artist since I was five years old, um, and it's really the only thing I was ever interested in. Um, but I suppose growing up in Australia at the time, there wasn't really all that much arts culture, um, and I didn't really think that being an artist was a viable um, so I went into teaching because I thought, well, I can, you know, teach people about what I love so much and maybe that will be enough. But I got into it and I, I quickly realized that, you know, teaching kids about what I want myself was very unfulfilling for me personally. Um, it's also a lot harder than I thought it was, um, Teaching is difficult, <laughs> um, but I suppose like a combination of a dissatisfaction with my job, um, as well as being in an abusive relationship at the time made me, it really like gave me the push that I needed to get out of Australia. Um, so I applied for an artist residency through a website called Res Artists, great website. It's got a list of all the different kinds of residencies across the world really. Um, and I ended up at a residency at a place called OT301 in Amsterdam, over to 301. Um, and 
yeah, I was, I was really lucky to kind of land myself there. It was this really, really interesting space. It's like, I suppose like a cultural center. It used to be a film school, um, but they've turned it in this culture, cultural center and it has a pirate radio station, a vegan kitchen, a club, a cinema, a theater, a bar, um, a yoga studio, and then also artist residency spaces. Um, and yeah, when I was there for those three months in that residency, it was probably the first time that I'd allowed myself to make art full time. Um, and really had allowed myself to can look at myself as an artist. Um, but yeah, so my first week there, I went to a club called the school and it was my first ever clubbing experience. Um, uh, it was very sheltered in Australia. Um, and I, I was really taken with the architecture and the light in the space. Um, it, what I really loved about it was at a certain point in the morning when the sun rose, the space was filled with smoke um, and, you know, the light was streaming in from the outside and Dutch light is just, it, Dutch light is special. Um, and it just lit up the room with this beautiful pink from the sunrise and it just really kind of, sparked something um so I emailed them as soon as I got home um and I asked them to do a uh installation with them which wasn't out of the ordinary because it's um it's basically this club but it also has a 24-hour art gallery so um you can kind of take a break and you know go and sit in the middle of these really beautiful light and video installations. At the time I was, uh, they had um, a piece by Children of the Light, um, which is a Dutch collective. Um, but yeah, so I emailed them and they said, yes, come in for a meeting. And I spoke to them about what I wanted to do. And uh, yeah, they, they let me produce a installation for them, which is the one that is on the screen at the moment. Um, Basically, it is uh, a, it's 1,200 individually folded pieces of paper, um, which I, you know, strung up and arranged um, in this kind of, I suppose, cloud shape. And uh, over the top, I had two projectors, um, which were projecting a, a documentation of the light in Amsterdam over a 24-hour period. Um, and how that changed. It was sped up to the, I think about 30 minutes on loop. Um, but it was, it was kind of everything that I wanted it to be in that, you know, at certain times of the night, the room would be filled with smoke um, and the light would kind of become thick and tangible. I, re I really love the effect um, that light has when you know, passing through smoke or particles and how it looks like a solid object almost. Um, I'll show you a couple of other, that was it, not lit up. Um, that was while I was still building it. Um, you can kind of see the structure of it a little bit more. Um, and that was it during one of the clubbing nights with people lying underneath. Um, was also something that I really loved was seeing people interact with my work outside of a traditional gallery setting. Um, you know, people would come in from the club and, you know, want a chill out zone and they would just kind of sit underneath and, um, you know, stare at the work for hours. Um, and it was really interesting watching some of the interactions that happened there at, at certain times, it turned into almost like a performance space. Um, I had a very good friend come and visit me in Amsterdam and she was a opera singer and she did like an impromptu opera performance underneath it, which was really quite wonderful to see. Um, yeah. So basically the piece spanned about, 
think it was about six meters in length. Um, and originally it was only meant to be um, up for a weekend, uh, but they seemed to like it enough to want me to keep it on for the whole month. So it was, I had that installation in that venue. And then I also had another exhibition um, at OT301 where my original residency was. Um, and yeah, I suppose it was that time that I really, um, I really realized that, you know, this is what I want to do. And um, it really gave me a bit of a push. Um, so when I left, when I left Amsterdam, I contacted Bergheim and I asked to do an installation for them. And they said, yes, uh, you should do something for New Year's. Um, but, you know, the closer we got to it, we kind of realized that paper being a flammable uh, material, uh, it wasn't suitable for their venue. Um, and I think, I think that really knocked me down, um, you know, not being able to do that piece for them uh, as it was really the only thing that I'd planned for. I, um, I felt like I moved to London and I didn't really, it wasn't a choice to move to London. It was kind of out of necessity. Um, and so I, I kind of fell into a bit of a depression um, and experienced a lot of creative block because I was unhappy with the position I was in creatively. I had absolutely no money um, and I was sleeping under my mother's kitchen table. <laughs> um, as, as lovely as her house is, um, I, I, I do need a bed. Um, but then I, then I found myself in Hackney Wick and um, I think that place really saved me. Like while I was, you know, still experiencing this wider creative block, which was really the first time in my life that I had experienced that because I'd never tried to dedicate myself to this full time. And I realized how crippling creative block can actually be. Um, but yeah, going into Hackney Wick and, you know, seeing everyone else making regardless of their financial situation um, and, you know, not just making in the way that they knew how, but um, but really pushing themselves to, you know, get outside of their comfort zone. Um, it, you know, it pushed me in different directions. So while I wasn't physically making any art at that point, I really got into poetry and writing. Um, and I, I started using that as a way to explore what was going on inside because I was having a lot of battles uh, with myself dealing with, you know, the abuse that I experienced from my past relationships and, um, you know, not really knowing where I belonged or kind of stood in the world. Um, yeah, I, I think also, you know, the not making made me feel quite worthless. Like, I call myself an artist, but I'm not making any art. So who am I and what am I? Um, so that was, that was really quite difficult. Um, the way I kind of got through that and pulled myself out was um, through uh, life drawing. Uh, on, let me skip ahead a little bit. Yeah, it was through life drawing. Um I found, you know, by drawing what was in front of me, it was, you know, keeping my hands moving um, enough to feel like I was actually making something, even though it wasn't, you know, a masterpiece. It was me exploring art in some way. Um, and I, I suppose... I started when I when I was doing life drawing. I, I got more interested in you know shadows and how we look at the body, um, and kind of deconstructing figures into shapes and shadows. Um, and I think I think that was it was a necessary part of my 
development in terms of, you know, drawing and painting. Um, I mean, I, I, I studied drawing and painting at university, but uh, the way it was taught, it was very much like, oh, um, just try and do it wrong and make mistakes and you'll find your style. But, you know, we weren't really, we weren't taught any techniques. Um, I think that was their plan. But, um, yeah, I kind of left art school not really learning anything um, and with quite a lot of debt. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I want to go back just quickly, uh, to my influences. Um, I think I kind of jumped in too soon with my residency, but, uh, um, there are a couple of artists that I look to, uh, when I'm making, um, the first is Anthony McCall, who basically does what I was explaining about earlier, he, he looks at light as a physical object um, through projection and, um, and the intention of smoke into a space. So I don't know, I really, I really love his, like how simple his works are, but how effective, um, like you walk into one of the exhibitions and it's interactive and I mean, it's just a simple projection of a line, um, but it's, because it lights up everything in between the projector and the wall, it it just becomes solid and it completely changes the way that you move within a space. You tend to move around it or, you know, you're tentative to put your hand through the light. Um, and yeah, I, I, think, I think his work is really beautiful. Um, I also take a lot of, um, a lot of inspiration from Kurt Schwitters uh, in particular, in particular, his Mertzbau, which was what he called the home that he built for himself. He kind of, he would he would pick up pieces of junk from the street and, you know, build them into his house and turn that into, um, uh, turn it into like a piece of art. Um, and when, when I show you my self-portrait, um, I think you might see where that, you know, comes into my own work. Um, but yeah, I, I think I think the way that he looks at geometry and um, considers space um, really, really interesting. Um, let's get through. Uh, so my self-portrait, um, uh, actually, Let's go, yeah, um, sorry. Uh, so my self-portraits uh, I made after this kind of creative block. It was the first thing that I really felt like I had achieved uh, since my residency. Um, it was basically built from just random pieces of junk wood that I found on the street. It started with this... Uh, enormous box, two and a half meter box uh, that I found outside of uh, outside of Victoria Wolf. Um, and I dragged it home with great difficulty and it kind of sat in my living room for about a month while I was just looking at it and trying to work out what to do. And in that time, I was picking up different pieces from the street. Um, I picked up a section of a barrel. Um, I think there was part of a cabinet and then just a lot of random pieces of wood. Um, and I kind of started, you know, sawing them and joining them. Um, keep in mind, I had never worked with wood before or really um, physical sculpture. Like I'd done installations, but that was working with paper. Um, so it was really just trial by fire as to, you know, what worked. Um, and how I would actually, you know, join things. Um, I quickly realized that wood putty was my best friend um, and, you know, got a little bit of um, direction from friends who knew a bit more than me. 
Um, but yeah, I worked on that for about seven months and then really hit a wall um, and kind of struggled with it for a little bit. Um, I kind of went through that whole creative block thing again, just because I didn't know, I didn't know where the piece was going. I didn't know what it was. Um, I knew it was something important, but I hadn't really understood what it was that I was making. Um, and it wasn't until um, one day I decided to microdose and really just focus on the piece um, that I had a breakthrough with it. Um, I kind of realized that what I was actually making was fundamentally a self-portrait. Um, not necessarily of my appearance, <laughs> as you can see, it's extremely abstract, um, but rather, you know, my viewpoint of the world. Um, I think in reaction to the abuse that I've had in the past, um, it, I, I, I kind of disconnected from reality in a sense. Uh, for a, a time and I was kind of unable to exist in my body without feeling incredible depression. Um, so I guess the work is uh, the way that I see and make sense of a world that is cruel. Um, basically I, I chunk things down into their base shapes um, I deconstruct faces. Sometimes I find it really difficult to concentrate when I'm talking to someone uh, because I'm breaking apart their face into, you know, different shapes and shadows and angles. And I'm, I'm kind of deconstructing it to a point where they're completely abstract. Um, yeah. And I, I tend to lose track of the conversation a lot of the time. Uh, Things and pretty much everything um, in order to understand them as entities. Um, I, I guess when I was making this piece, I didn't consider art to be uh, particularly cool. It was really just, you know, the only thing that I could do to prevent depression, um, control it in a sense. Um, it's really just what keeps me alive and feeds me. Um, yeah, it's kind of like breathing. It's an impulsion. Uh, it's a compulsion. Um, but yeah, so that that's why I consider this piece to be a self-portrait um, because it's not my face, but it's, you know, my guts and my insides and everything that I have in my body that I wanted to express to the world. Um, both, you know, beautiful and painful. Um, and I suppose through, you know, the quick, clean whiteness of the piece, um, it sort of creates these shadows. Um, and, you know, throughout the day, it, it changes, like uh, in the daytime, it is um, a completely different piece, um, depending on where the shadow, uh, where the light is, um, it can cast really, really beautiful shadows. And then, you know, um, at night it has these lights inside it, um, which, you know, create these really lovely refractions. And um, I don't know if you can see down the bottom, there's one section where um, the light is positioned in just the right way that it splits. It splits the beam of light that's coming out uh, from behind that triangle and it splits into blue and red. Um, and yeah, I, I, that was just like a really lovely little detail that I really liked. Um, but yeah, I, I really loved that, you know, the piece changed and evolved over the time, over time. And it wasn't just, you know, stagnant. Um, it, it kind of developed a personality of its own. Um, it's kind of unpredictable. Um, yeah, I've got a couple of pictures that I took uh, film on, on my 35 millimeter uh, film camera while I was making it. Um, and yeah, I really liked the shapes that it kind of created. It was unfinished in these pictures. Um, but this is kind of something that I do quite a lot. I will 
produce one piece of work and then I will take photos of it and I will recontextualize it into something else. So um, I'll do, you know, a series of paintings uh, based on the shapes that come up or a series of drawings or, you know, it might, you know, kind of just sit for a long time, but eventually I tend to always kind of come back to it. Um, yeah, uh, these are photographs that I think I'm probably going to use in the coming weeks. I would really like to uh, revisit, you know, the shapes that I was exploring with these pieces. Um, you can see in this one, it, it the piece didn't actually end up like that. The piece that's kind of laid over that circle ended up way down at the bottom, but I was kind of trying to work out, you know, how it would all fit together uh, while the pieces were still movable. Um, yeah, so I suppose uh, something that came up after I finished that piece was, you know, this fear of creative block again. Um, I kind of went through a few weeks where I was really terrified at the fact that I'd created did something that I loved so much. It took me nine months to make. Um, and I was worried that, you know, I wouldn't create anything of similar value ever again, um, which is just a stupid story that, you know, I think creatives tell ourselves, um, you make one good thing and, you know, then nothing else in the future is gonna compare. Um, I don't know if that's just me, but <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so thankfully, um, I don't want to say thankfully, uh, but I suppose thankfully for me, uh, what, you know, the whole coronavirus lockdown situation brought was I was put on furlough. Um, and I, I think, um, I think when that rolled around I was really anxious for the first two weeks because I didn't know how I was going to manage to keep myself busy but then you know I realized it was really more of a blessing in that I was able well, at that time my studio space was in my house I was living in peanut factory and I was living and working there um, and so I got to spend you know months just working on my own work um, and I kind of ended up in a boost phase. Um, and I think, I think during lockdown, I kind of realized how it is that I stay in that phase or manage that whole, you know, creative block, creative boost war that kind of goes on. Um, so what I've managed to do with that is I work on multiple pieces at a time. I work on big things. I work on little th things. I work on, um, you know, things that mean a lot to me, things that don't necessarily mean a lot to me, little drawings, big paintings, a little bit of everything. Um, and I, I just try to do something every day because I feel like if I've got multiple projects going on at a time, um, I've always got something that I can jump into. Uh, whereas if I'm working on one piece, like my self-portrait, um, it really puts me at risk at falling into creative block because, you know, you finish that piece and there's just a sudden end and then you have to come up with a whole new concept or um, just like a whole new idea for a piece. And yeah, if I've got lots of things going on at the go, on the go at one time, I find it much easier because if I'm not feeling working on one piece at a certain time I can work on something completely different and if I don't want to do painting I can do sculpture if I don't want to do sculpture I can do printmaking um yeah so it really helps me not to burn out I think like um even when even when I don't feel like making any art at all I make sure I do something every day whether it's priming a board or um or you know like sanding a piece of wood that I found on the street um but yeah that combination of simple and complicated uh projects really has helped me um I suppose during lockdown I kind of fell in love with painting um 
Oh, this is this is one of my favorite painters. Um, I'm really, really inspired by his work. His name is Remnan Alexander Teiko. He is a Australian Japanese artist uh, living and working in Sydney. Um, but I really love his uh, the way he approaches light um, as well as space. Um, yeah, uh, that he's probably my biggest painting influence. I'm actually really excited. I got given uh, one of his pieces for my 30th birthday. It's on its way to me soon um, and I can't wait. <laughs> um, yeah, it's very exciting uh, buying work from artists that you admire. But yeah, so I, during the first lockdown, I started experimenting with painting for the first time since uni. Um, and I was, I suppose, trying to work out how to paint because, you know, I mean, they didn't really teach us anything when it came to technical skill. Um, so I was working with a combination of, you know, acrylic house paint as well as oil paints. And uh, something that I found that I absolutely love was um, like a bitumen gutter paint. So in this piece, you can, you can see it's basically anything that's brown um, is painted with that. And it's got this gorgeous, uh, this gorgeous like sheen to it. Like when you put it on thick, it, it just ends up being really black and then you thin it out and it's just this really rich kind of brown. And then you mix it with, you know, white oil paints and it, it kind of dulls and becomes a little bit more ashy and you mix it with acrylic house paint and it resists the paint in quite an interesting way. Um, which you'll see in a couple of later paintings. Um, but yeah, so these are some of my my first paintings that I was working on. Um, this piece started off as a painting of a stairwell. It was up the other way, um, kind of turned like that. Um, but I started working on it and I wasn't particularly fond of it, but there was a shadow that was falling on the boards as I was painting it and I kind of fell in love with that so I started painting around the shadow um and then that kind of brought me more into abstraction um and you know I started working with you know intersecting lines and diagonals and working with you know under drawings um and not necessarily following the shapes and colors that were in the original image. And that's that's probably something that I have uh, started working with a lot more. Um, this piece was based on the Peanut Factory. Um, it is, I don't know, it's kind of hard to see, um, but it is basically a view of the Peanut Factory from multiple different viewpoints. So from an interior and exterior, if you look at it a certain way, you'll be able to see um, your inside a house uh, and you're looking out these big doors that open up, um, which was part of my warehouse. And you're looking out onto a courtyard of red gates. Um, and then from another viewpoint, it's looking at the peanut factory from, you know, the inside of the yard of 22 SME. 22 Smade Road um, and I really liked how you know overlaying those those two things um, really messed with perception like I like that you can stare at it for a long time and you'll come out with different things um, and yeah I, I think it creates quite an interesting um an interesting perception of a space. Uh, this next piece was done in a similar way. Um, it was based off a photograph that I took of the peanut factory. Um, and I started working with intersecting lines and, um, and kind of messing around with the color and, uh, you know, basically extending lines out uh, in order to abstract it. Um, this is a diptych I'm about to send off to Australia. Um, and at the 
bottom right hand corner you can kind of see that texture that i was talking about when you uh, i don't know if you can see my cursor but around here and also i suppose here um i i've kind of started to introduce that texture where you mix acrylic uh house paint and this bitumen gutter paint together and it kind of resists um can i was that something that i can do no it's not something that I can do. Um, yeah, so this one, um, I kind of took a similar approach in that it is two shots from the same interior of this found, of this farmhouse. Like if you tilt your head to one side, uh, you can kind of see the beams of the roof. Um, and then if you put your head up the other way, uh, it's basically got this mantle of a fireplace um with like a shadow underneath but generally what i'll do is i'll draw the two images over the top of one another and then i'll go in and fill it in in certain places um and then paint over the top and layer things um and kind of almost forget the image and fall into the abstract um yeah i suppose i suppose during lockdown i kind of I fell in love with painting um, and it's really all I've been doing for the last year. Um, I've attempted some small sculptures, but it's really been like the main thing. Um, I really like how, you know, we take these dirty dilapidated things and we kind of turn them into objects of desire, which is, um, I suppose, this obsession with making what's grungy clean or, um, like, I don't know, taking away, uh, taking away the dirt or what we think is unsightly from an area. Um, so basically in line with this, I, uh, I take discarded materials and I like to transform them. Um, uh, I actually went, I went dumpster that dumpster diving this weekend and I found some great stuff um which I'm really excited about uh I'll show you some of it towards the end but sometimes like when I find pieces it's really hard not to be inspired by them and you know they kind of almost tell me what they want to be um or something about them indicates how I'm going to work with them um it's <sighs> Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I also really like to turn a piece around while I work. Um, that's probably, this is probably a good example of that. So like when I'm, when I'm working on a piece, it doesn't, I don't make it with any idea of which way it's going to go in the end. I'll, you know, turn it and twist it. And I think that probably has something to do with, you know, how, everything in the area is, you know, constantly changing and, you know, living in a warehouse, um, you know, you're living with, I mean, I've lived with 13 people and I've lived with eight people and those people are constantly rotating. Um, so it, it, your experience within the space can, you know, change week to week sometimes, um, depending on the dynamic between people. But yeah, so with that, I really like to, you know, turn a piece while I'm working with it. And, you know, then when I feel like I've finished the painting, then I will go and have a proper look at it and turn it each way and kind of decide where it's going to land um, or which way it's going to sit. Um, I also really like that, you know, in doing that, whoever buys the work can kind of decide for themselves if they want to hang it a certain way. Um, if that works better for them, I, I think, you know, go for it. Um, these are some other pieces that I've made recently. They were made out of, um, I suppose, I think they were discarded vinyl drawers um, for like holding records. Um, and, you know, on the side of them, uh, they, I don't, I don't think I have any here. Um, on the side of them, they had the names of what was in um, each drawer. And so each piece is kind of named after that. I think this is, 
I actually can't remember the name for this one. I know this is uh, Red and Batcher, uh, and this is Temples. Um, and this is a commission that I have recently done uh, for a client in China. It's uh, a viewpoint of the peanut factory. Um, I kind of fell in, in, into an obsession with that uh, while I was moving out. I just, just kept painting the peanut factory over and over again. Um, and so this is the peanut factory from, you know, multiple different viewpoints. Uh, this is, you know, one side of the street with, you know, the stairs going up and some of the graffiti on the sides. And then this is 22 Smead Road, Smead Road where I used to live and you have the entranceway. But I've kind of joined them together and overlaid the images. And then, you know, when I got a little bit further on, I started putting symbols in the piece. So... This shape here, this line work, is uh, basically about a friendship that I lost um, a very, well, she was my best friend uh, over the, the last year during lockdown. Um, and this was the shape of her bedroom window, um, which was in another warehouse. But, you know, I, I started overlaying, you know, these kind of shapes and I have it mirrored down here and I started to bring the curve into the other side um just as like a uh point of reference to i suppose letting go um when i when i painted this i just left the warehouses i'd stopped living in hackney wick um and i picked up a studio on the other side of hackney wick um but yeah i i, I think this i painted this as a way of coping with that drastic change that happened really you know in the span of about a month I decided I was moving and then you know everything just went mad and you know moved and changed really quickly um this is like a similar kind of thing it's this is more of an imagined space but I was basically working with painting uh different architectural sites and um, this piece here is a part of a bust, like a statue. Um, so I was painting them over the top of uh, one another. This was probably an earlier piece where I was still trying to, you know, get used to that style and uh, make my brain kind of work in that way. Um, and actually, before I get to, actually, you know what, we can go to that. Um, yeah, so I suppose I'm looking at the whole shithouse to penthouse effects um, and how Hackney Wick has, you know, changed over the time that I've been there um, and, you know, how these luxury apartments are kind of popping up um, and, you know, the disconnect between that and its roots, um, which is probably why I've started recently painting more um, lush, beautiful interiors um, and trying to abstract them. So this piece uh, is a, it's a, it's a building in London. I think it's called White Rabbit House. Uh, but I really loved the colour. It was something completely different to what I'd done before, but I really wanted to challenge myself um, and see if I could paint it as if I was looking through this homemade glass kaleidoscope that I had made so you know I started imagining the light refractions and you know uh, layering different parts over and over again that kind of repetition um, and yeah it, it's kind of something that I'm playing around with quite a lot at the moment in my new pieces um, this is a piece that I finished a couple of days ago. Um, it's based off a similar building, but again, multiple different viewpoints. So it's like, it's the same space, but looking at it from different angles. Um, and so I laid them over the top of one another and started painting and, um, and kind of abstracting what, one thing that I seem to have throughout all of my recent paintings is this diagonal line from one side to the other. 
And I really like, I mean, you can kind of see it here. It's not quite as obvious, um, but I really like that in abstracting uh, an image just as a starting point because it immediately just creates a separation uh, and an instant, like, quite aesthetically pleasing angle that I can work from. Um, and it starts to kind of bring geometry into something that might not initially be that way. Um, yeah, so this is my studio at the moment. I've recently moved into a place called uh, Hackneywick Underground. It's just being set up. I've been there since the start of January. Um, and it's basically, uh, it is this kind of shared studio space. It's right opposite, uh, right next to Doe, uh, Doe Bakery, um, if anyone knows it. Um, but basically it's, it's going to be, I guess, like a cultural hub. So the plan for it is to have lots of different studio spaces. There's going to be a screen printing studio. There's going to be um, a uh, photography studio. And, you know, we've got people from all different disciplines working in the space. Um, so at the moment, there are only three people using it there's myself there's another painter and then there's a couple who are basically um they're recycling pots and and painting them and kind of yeah creating creating artful pots um but yeah so this is this is the space it has been so amazing <laughs> um in allowing me to explore my work a little bit further. I can work on much larger pieces. I can work on several pieces at once. Um, as you can see from this, like this is all stuff that I've made from the start of January um, and it's not even all of it. Um, but basically being on furlough, it means that I'm kind of treating my work as a full-time job. So I'm in there making every day um, and, you know, yeah, I, I think working amongst other people um, and seeing how they push themselves is really helping me push myself in my own work. And uh, it's, it's really motivating me to, you know, get in and uh, kind of invest in myself, I suppose. Um, I guess, you know, because I... It, Art is something that I've wanted to do ever since I was a kid, but I never really invested in myself up until uh, recently, um, or I never really gave myself that freedom. But it's been like a real journey from, oh, this is what I want to do. Oh, I don't know if I can do it. I guess I'll go and do something else. Oh, wait, I don't like this other thing that I'm doing. Um, uh, but this is what I really want to do, but can I make that work as a business? Um, and I suppose in that, in that period that I was in, I, I started working at a place called Thumbprint Editions, um, which has been amazing for me. It's, um, it's basically like a printmaking studio. We do traditional techniques um, like woodblock printing and etching, um, and we print for other much larger artists. But, you know, working there really enhanced my skills with printmaking. I learned a lot um, and I've, I've kind of brought it into my own work. But I think the biggest influence that I've had from working there is uh, the main artist that I work for and print for is called Harlan Miller and he's a painter and he, he makes these enormous, um, enormous, like very painterly uh, book covers, I guess. But in order to produce his work, I had to, he, he wanted the prints to look like paintings. So I had to really study his work um, and kind of imagine how he was producing these images and then kind of translate that into printing. So by learning how to print something that looks like a painting, I kind of learned to paint, even though I wasn't painting myself if that makes sense. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that was, that has been, you know, my biggest takeaway from working at Thumbprint that, and, you know, getting to work with, you know, incredible artists that I really admire. And I suppose seeing that, you know, all of these other people are doing it. So maybe it is actually possible. Um, yeah. So I suppose, I suppose that is about it. Um, oh, actually, no, before that, um, this is a piece that I'm working on at the moment, which I'm really, really excited about. Oh, okay, no, I've got a few more. I'm sorry. I know I'm going along for a while. Um, this is a piece that I'm working on at the moment. It was originally pulled out of a dumpster outside of um, Greenhouse in Hackneywick. It was a door. Um, and I went in and I rebuilt into it. Um, so some sections are three-dimensional um, and some are two-dimensional. Um, and I wanted to uh, really, you know, take that concept like a step further um, by, you know, messing with people's perception of a space um, by, you know, not creating a physically flat image. So, you know, as you move around it, it does change. Um, and, you know, I've, I've basically overpainted certain shadows. Um, so you're not really sure if what you're looking at is actually a shadow or something that's painted. Um, and then I'm also kind of refracting things and painting them one over the top of the other. Um, I want to make sure that everyone understands that this is very much a work in progress. It's, yeah, it is still very much in the works. These are some things that I'm really, really excited about at the moment. Um, I pulled them out of a dumpster near Greenhouse uh, on Saturday. And I think they are, I think they were used for laser cutting or something. Um, but they're basically these boards with, you know, these metal inlays um, in different weird kind of configurations. I think this was for an envelope. And then you flip it over the other side. So one side is quite sculptural and then the other side is quite flat with just this thin uh, silver kind of line. Um, and so I painted this yesterday. Um, I'm not hundred percent if it's finished yet, but basically I used the silver kind of outline um, to abstract the work. So you look at it, it's a window. Um, but each individual square is different in tone. And so I wanted to abstract it uh, in terms of color and tone rather than in its physicality. Um, with this piece here, I'm kind of doing a little bit of that, but then I kind of want to abstract it even more. Um, if you, there we go. So this is a piece that the, the little booklet um, is a piece that I did the night before I moved to Amsterdam. Um, uh, it was just like a, a random little portrait, but I kind of wanted, I, I saw this piece of wood with the two circles and I thought, what a great opportunity to revisit that. So I'm kind of creating a self-portrait um, and I am, I'm going to abstract it using the circles that are in the piece. So you've got these two rings here and then I've added a third. And I don't know, I suppose when I'm, when I'm making, I kind of create these rules for myself. Um, like, you know, everything in these circles is painted in a different color. Everything outside is monochrome. Um, but, you know, that, that's still kind of an idea that I'm playing with. And yeah, now I think I am actually at the end of my slides. Um, that's fantastic, Emily. Um, thank, you. thank you for showing us your work and talking about it and your uh, life pretty much as well um, and coming uh, to, from Australia to London. Um, uh, there are a couple of questions. If people want to ask questions, could you put them in the in the chat? Um, I'm sure there's quite a few things we want to ask. Jordana, um, Jordana um, from Grove, um, Jordana Greaves, um, so since bit serious apologies, this was explained in the intros. Uh, I missed the first 10 minutes. As an artist, as an artist, I'm also interested in shadows. I'm wondering why shadows interest you and feature in your work. I, I'm actually not quite sure. They've, it's just 
I think it's how I learnt to draw and look at the world. And I, I suppose I suppose part of it is, you know, based on, you know, that thing that my brain does where I chunk things down into, you know, basic geometric shapes. Um, when I'm interacting with people or looking at an object, I'll, I'll kind of deconstruct it in my, in my brain. And I think um, just in doing that, it, it kind of pulls out the shadows quite easily. Um, so it's, it's sort of what I've focused on a lot. Um, I think also, you know, being really interested in light in the creation of an image um, that also, I mean, when you, when you talk about light, it implies, you know, shadow or darkness in some way. Um, and it's that kind of contrast of the two things that, you know, really inform our idea of an object or a space, if that makes sense. Yeah. Getting a thumbs up. Um, I, 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 I said quite early on um, in, in response to your um, comment about fear of making something and never being able to make anything that, again, you know, that's the, and I, you know, I, I mean, being long in the tooth maybe helps with experience, but um, it doesn't really help with that because I think, you know, even myself, and a lot of artists, writers and musicians have a fear of mm. not being able to create a piece of art that lives up to the last one they've made, you know. That yeah. In music, they call it second album syndrome. You know, you, a band spends, you know, they spend two years rehearsing songs and they finally get a record deal and they make an amazing album and, and then the record company says, right, can you make another one? And they just fall apart, yeah. you know. And, yeah. Oh, I'll do it. do it. It's really common, yeah. isn't it? But it is. of course you get through it. Yeah, it is really, really common. And I, I mean, I, I'm sure I'll go through periods of creative block in the future, but for now I, I seem to have, you know, found something that works for me. Like by never letting myself completely finish something or, you know, always having something that's already half finished, you know, it's not, easy, it's not, it's not difficult to, you know, jump into something else. But I think if you're working on one thing at a time, um, it is quite uh, quite difficult to then, you know, start from scratch and make something brand new. Um, whereas, you know, if you've got lots of things on the go at the one time or, you know, even even just the start of something, you know, you're halfway yeah. there. You're halfway there. I think, I, I don't know, I mean, I think a lot of that, I think the trick to make money is to um, find a formula and keep repeating it. But mm. I don't think that's really being an artist, is it? <laughs> no, I know. It's like, it's, it's quite difficult because I've also like, obviously, you know, this is what I want to do for a career. And, you know, I seem to have kind of found something that works that people want to have in their house. But, you know, I think you start being an artist when you stop evolving. Um, and, mm. You know, I look at a lot of quite famous artists that are just repeating the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. And, you know, people will always buy it because it looks pretty. But I think if you don't allow your practice to evolve, it kind of loses all meaning. Um, yeah. So I do want to, you know, kind of constantly push myself, um, you know, to, to go in different directions or try new things or, you know, I suppose that's kind of why I got into, you know, looking at poetry and, you know, writing a little bit more because um, what was, what I'd been doing before wasn't working for me anymore. So I needed to find some other kind of outlet. Um, I really, a lot of artists shy away from the idea that art can be a therapeutic or a kind of healing mm -hmm. kind of activity. You seem very honest about it, and you, you're very, um, very open that you know I, I did this and I needed to get through this problem, and this it evolved into this piece of art. And you, you don't seem to mind that at all. It's, is it? You think that's kind of, I guess, back in when I was at art college, it was they used to come round and say it's not therapy, you know, and things like that to you. And I used to think yeah. actually, 
I'm not that bothered about it, but if it is therapy, I don't mind. I don't good. mind if it is therapy. Like I, I think, I think we all need to find our own coping mechanisms to get through the world. And you know, I, I suppose like some of, I mean, I, I didn't mention them, but some of my favorite influences are outsider artists. Um, you know, people that have had really kind of messed up. Uh, messed up existences like uh my favorite is Adolf Werfle um and he was basically uh in institutions from a young age I think he was um I think he was molested as a child and then you know ended up in foster care and then you know committed a crime and went to jail and spent his entire life in jail and so he didn't really have any understanding of the outside world but um he explored the world through drawing um, and he kind of created his own world. So it was like he used that as a coping mechanism to, you know, be in this enclosed space. Um, and I think, I think art is really important in doing that. Like it can really help you work through issues. Like I've, I've, I tried therapy and it didn't really work, but you know, if I'm working on a piece, it, it kind of works out my problems for me almost or you know gives me that space to just be in a safe space uh where i'm not um i'm not affected by all the stresses of everything else that's going on in my life it's you know a, a time where i can just be in my own brain and kind of create and all the other voices kind of disappear and i'm kind of in a trance um, although I suppose in that way, like a lot of the time when I finish working on a piece, I kind of look at it and I'm like, oh, I didn't, I didn't make that because I go into this trance, this kind of flow. And it's like my hands are making something, but I'm not really aware of what I'm doing. It just kind of creates itself. So I don't know. Sometimes I feel like a fraud when I, when I step back and I look at my work and I'm like, I don't feel like I had any real input into this. It just kind of happened. Um, which is, you know, quite a quite a bizarre experience. Um, it is, but I think it, I don't think it's uncommon either. And I think a lot no. of people, a lot of artists do feel like kind of once you take your ego out of it and and it becomes it becomes something and outside mm. of you. That, I mean, or else you're kind of more in the realms of illustrating an idea or something like that. Yeah, I've got another I've got another um, question here. So, oh, yeah. um, Liz, Liz Noble, hi Liz, she says, uh, really excited by your work, the layering points of view is such an interesting process, how it pulls you in to look so closely and find new elements that you missed the first time. So more, more of a statement than a question. But, um, oh, I love that, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I suppose, I suppose uh, with my work, um, I'm trying to get people to look at objects or spaces or people um, from multiple, multiple kind of views. And yeah, I suppose it's kind of like a common thread throughout most of my work, even, even from, you know, that earlier installation that I showed you, it's like, you can move around it. Um, and it, it kind of completely changes, you know, from one, from one view, it's completely different. And then, you know, with the introduction of, of light, um, it alters and, you know, changes even more like a shadow um you know that's cast off one piece will um make something completely invisible from one side and then you kind of move around or you know the light shifts in a certain way and um and it's kind of suddenly a new a new object a new piece um i'm really interested in you know th this is probably something i really want to explore you know, coming up, but, you know, how light kind of changes throughout the day. Um, there's a piece that I, I'm kind of planning where I'm going to, you know, pick a brutalist building. I love brutalist architecture, but I'm going to pick a building and I'm going to document all the shadows. Um, I've got a hundred individually made Japanese Kozo cards um, and I'm going to kind of in an abstract way, document every single shadow in and outside the building. Um, and it, that 
I suppose I'll be looking at that as like a portrait of the space without actually showing the space. I'm, I'm just showing the shadows um, yeah. and, you know, how it, how it changes and how it moves throughout a day. Um, yeah. I, I am not sure if that quite makes sense without a visual that, which leads me to like ask you maybe how do you, would you, how would you feel about, you know, if you say you make a hundred of those um, and you, uh, would, how would you feel about doing an animation or something like that? You know, in, in a sense, I mean, that would, that would you're, be making a kind of, you're making a kind of flip, flip book by, mm. by that kind of uh, frames, aren't we, in a sense? I would really love to do something like that. I'm, uh, for the last three years, I haven't had a laptop, so I, I've kind of lost <laughs> my computer proficiency, but I'm going to buy one soon. <laughs> um, and so that's something that I can kind of then go in and explore. I'd, I would really like to get into animation and, you know, um, you know, film or something like that a little bit more and work more with like time-based mediums. Um, but yeah, I really, I really like that idea. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan of Kurt Schwitter's, uh, you I know, he's... Work. Yeah. I think there was a, you know, there's a sort of tendency to see him in two kind of veins, either as a kind of provocateur, a Dadaist mm. or something, and, or on the other sense, as a formalist, you know, this kind of mm. structures that he built as kind of quite formal. But I think there's a thing there. That you yeah, kind it's of an interesting there. duality. But I think there's, a, there's something that you picked up on, in, which is a kind of mm. the emotional input gives, gives the quite formal aspect of, of, of his work and your work it gives it yeah. some kind of charge really but, but I'm sure there's a lot of backstories to a lot of his seemingly kind of random or seemingly kind of criti yeah. critical capitalism collages you know I would I would love to know more I mean I haven't made a collage in a while but you know I, I suppose my self-portrait is kind of a collage of of sorts it's you know different random pieces that I picked up from the street um but like each of those pieces has a little story behind it. And, you know, I look at his work and I'm like, oh, wow, where did you get that? What's that from? You know, how did you come across that? Why did you pick these pieces to be together? Um, and yeah, it does, it does imply like a, a story. I think anything with found objects kind of does that. Um, yeah, I, lo I, lo I love his work. I love his aesthetic. I'm kind of planning at the moment. Um, I want to build a desk for myself for the studio. Um, with that kind of same aesthetic, that, um, you know, sort of assemblage um, and, you know, kind of sharp forms with curved shapes and found objects. And, um, yeah, that's that's a future project that I really want to work on. But I, every time I look at his work, I get something new from it. Brilliant. I've got um, Stephanie Johnson says, very interesting story and thank you. What's the best way to follow your work? It's time, time to plug yourself now. Or like, <laughs> um, that is that would be my sister reminding me to, <laughs> to uh, plug myself. Um, so the best way to follow my work at the moment is probably through Instagram. It's emily.hanna, H-A-N-A. -A. Um, and I am, I'm kind of trying to put things up most days. I... I've never been particularly great with social media, but I've recently uh, employed a friend to help me with that um, because, again, just technology baffles me. Um, but, yeah, so Instagram, emily.hanna. Um, I've also got a website, which is emilyhanna.com. Um, and, yeah, basically through, through those. Either that or when the underground actually opens to the public when COVID allows um, it will be you know like an open studio space that people from the public can kind of walk through so um, when that eventually happens when COVID kind of dies down uh, come and say hi and have a look in person. That's brilliant um, thank you for ev everyone for coming to this uh, amazing talk thank you Emily. Um, thank you very much for having me. Brilliant work brilliant work and really interesting stories behind it um, thanks for coming to Grow at Home. Um, I'll just plug tomorrow night, uh, which is Wednesday, I think. I'm losing track of days. 
Um, and we've got our com comedy cabaret online, which was hilarious. So um, go to growhackney.co.uk uh, or Facebook, you know, Grow Hackney and log on to that and have a laugh. Um, we all need a laugh at the moment. Um, Boris Johnson didn't provide it too much last night, but, you know. Um, Emily, thanks a lot for coming. Thank you so and, much uh, for having me. Yeah, thanks for everyone for coming. Brilliant.